I'm speaking with Mark Brody, author of The Invisible Emperor, Napoleon on Elba from Exile to Escape. Thank you for speaking with me. Thanks for having me. So first, tell me how did uh, you get into studying and writing on this subject, and you can go as far back as you'd like. Uh, yeah, I guess it, it starts a little ways back. In graduate school, I was training as a uh, French historian, and uh, Napoleon, of course, looms large in that history. And mm -hmm. so when you learn about Napoleon, there are all these moments in his storied career. And toward the end, there is this... Uh, Elven exile, you know, he's at the height of his empire, he gets defeated, they send him to this tiny island, ten months later he escapes, and uh, he gets defeated again, and then they send him away to St. Helena. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, hold on here, let me hear a bit more about this Elven thing, that sounds kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody who's ruled over something like 80 million people, and then he gets sent to this tiny island, I want to know more. And that had kind of stuck with me, uh, even while I was writing my first book. Um, and I kind of came back to it, and I wanted, I wanted to read about it, and I couldn't really find anything that satisfying. So I decided, well, I'll research it myself, and maybe I'll even write about it. And uh, as often happens when you get these weird ideas, once you start doing the research, it gets even weirder, and it started to be this really incredible story, and um, I kind of stuck with it. I went down the little rabbit hole of research and came out with, with, the, with the book. Mm-hmm. So it's hard for me to. Uh, so my normal question is, tell me about the book. I've uh, I've read most of it already. It's it's I love it. Um, but yeah, t t tell me about the book as though I had never um, experienced it sure. yet. And that's lovely to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you know you'll you'll know that a lot of military history is really about these lightning bolt moments. Um, you know, moments of, of action and big you know, the decisive battles and all of that kind of drama. Mm. And this is a little bit of a different approach, which is to say, well, what happens in between these two obvious moments of drama? That we have Napoleon at the height of his empire being defeated, then this exile, and uh, after that you have Waterloo. Mm. So what happens in between? You know, that to me is actually, in a way, more interesting than those two battles which we already know so much about. Mm. Um, how does that time inform this bit of history. So that's really what I wanted to focus on, a kind of reverse military history, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, what did he get up to on this island? And so it kind of proceeds with a pretty clear beginning, middle, and, and end, almost like a, a jailbreak story or a, <laughs> a Robinson Crusoe story, even though, of course, this is nonfiction. Mm -hmm. You know, he gets sent to the island, he sets up there, he... Uh, he, what does he do? And then he escapes. So the, the real meat of the book is the day-to-day -day on the island. What's he thinking? Who's coming to see him? Uh, how does he defend himself? How is he plotting to escape? When does he start? Uh, and that's kind of set against a second character named uh, Neil Campbell, mm -hmm. who's this young colonel. And um, he's, in the, you know, he's a British officer. And he's sent there to sort of watch over Napoleon. And it's totally bizarre because he never really gets an official assignment. He's just sort of there as the lone Allied representative. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, luckily for me as a historian, this Campbell left a pretty detailed diary of everything that happened. So I've got sort of Napoleon's side of things, what, what, what's going on with him, and then here's this totally out-of-his-depth officer uh, in the presence of somebody he kind of idolizes, even though it's an enemy. Uh, and they're interacting quite often and you know, it's a kind of cat and mouse game as well. Uh, tr tracing out that relationship, I think, is sort of the main thrust of the book. Mm -hmm. um, it's also fascinating that uh, he wasn't just sent into exile. He was sort of granted this, you know, this new country to rule over. And, um, you know, it, the rest of his empire was taken from him. So that was an interesting, um, interesting sort of political dynamic, I guess. Yeah, and that's that's a question my my friends uh, always ask me. You know, as I was reading the book or writing the book, sorry, how come they sent him to Elba? You know, a day's sail from from the continent. What were they thinking? Why didn't they just you know say execute him? Uh, they, of course, being the heads of the Allied powers, and it, it's not. There's no real simple answer to that. Um, you know, I think that. If you're a sovereign ruling a, a British, uh, sorry, a, a European 
uh, nation at that time, you don't really want to set the precedent of, hey, uh, we defeated this guy, let's chop his head off. Mm -hmm. That's not really something anybody wants to do, uh, you know, so soon after the French Revolution. Um, I think there's a certain even level of respect. This is, this person is still an emperor. Uh, we, he lost fair and square. We're going to find some ad hoc solution that is not going to be killing him. Um, so they send him to this place. And as you said, it's, it's kind of this weird limbo moment. He gets to retain the title of emperor, for instance. He's the emperor of Elba. He's a legitimately recognized sovereign. They, they even, uh, the Allied powers and, and headed up by France, of course, uh, e- even let him train an army and keep a small navy because they don't want him to be, uh, assassinated. They want him to be able to be, uh, able to defend himself. Mm-hmm. So it's a sort of, in retrospect, sounds totally insane. What were they thinking? Mm-hmm. And yet this is kind of the solution they came up with it, came up with. And for a while it worked. And it, and, and, if I can just go on here for a second, mm-hmm. the other logical thing is what I wanted to know about is why did this guy leave? He had such a good setup there in a sense. Mm-hmm. He was a, a happy retired person by all appearances. You know, I've spent some time on Elba and it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got some family. He's got a few friends, not friends, I, I guess, but sort of uh, sycophants, people who are serving him and advising him. And he's relatively safe. So, why does he want to leave? Why does he want to come stir up trouble? And why do people let him return? Well, I was struck um, by how energetic uh, you portray him in the book. Um, just n- this energy that just won't let go. He just always has to do something, it seems like. Yeah, and that's this leads to some of the comedy, I suppose, uh, uh, of the book, is mm-hmm. seeing this person who's such a dynamo in this confined space and in these humbled circumstances, what does he do with all that energy? Napoleon's energy uh, was legendary even in, in, in his own time. Uh, Talleyrand, uh, who was his advisor for many years, and then sort of the guy behind the scenes propping up uh, replace the government that replaced Napoleon, he said, what a pity the man wasn't lazy, in kind of trying to explain all of the destruction of the past quarter century. Mm-hmm. Napoleon was far from lazy. He was very smart, very active, and um, always trying to kind of extend his horizons. He read a lot. He traveled a lot, obviously, um, saw a lot of the world, uh, and was interested in people, I think. Um, and so on Elba, where there's 12,000 subjects for him to command and less than 100 square miles of territory, it's sort of like you follow him running around in circles. He's, he's always trying to do something new. He's always out on a carriage ride or a horse ride, followed by his huge entourage, uh, trying to find some new adventure, trying to see something, some new part of the island, trying to keep himself entertained. Uh, and it, it ends up being quite entertaining to, to, to follow him. At least it was for me in the research. I was like, I can't believe he's doing this now. You know, he's climbing this mountain. He's cheating at cards. He's, playing practical jokes on his uh, advisors. Mm-hmm. So, and that leads me to ask, so, you know, this book could have taken various tones, and it does seem to have kind of a light-hearted comedy tone, so do you feel that that's sort of the approach you decided you wanted to take, or did the research kind of lend itself to that? I think it's, it's the second uh, in that the research led me to that kind of tone, but then I think that also sort of hits on the first, well, what are my research questions? What are the stories I'm interested in? Mm-hmm. Obviously, uh, there's a reason I sought this out and why it kind of tickled me in a way is that I thought it was sort of funny in its own dark way and, and a little bit sad. Um, and I had that hunch and, and then followed it, and it was um, borne out by these diaries, by what people wrote, uh, by what people in Europe who are kind of witnessing this from afar are thinking about, um, it was all a bit of a strange moment. Um, the other thing that I really liked, and I think this also explains the tone of the book, which is fairly intimate, uh, not really interested in sort of grandiose, um, let's say godlike perspectives, but very kind of detail oriented Mm -hmm. is this is something pretty new in, in the way that people are looking at Napoleon during his own lifetime. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's seen by more people 
a closer perspective than at any other point in his career. There's people who are literally coming from uh, England, let's say, um, and ask, they, they travel to Elba like tourists, and they say, hey, we'd like to meet the emperor of Elba. And they actually get to have lunch with Napoleon. I mean, this happens in real life. Yeah. You go up there and you say, uh, show me Napoleon. And Napoleon's bored and he's like, okay, let's have lunch. And they write about it. Um, and so for a historian, that's archival gold. You know, here's this legendary larger than life figure that people have actually seen from five feet away. Mm-hmm. Um, they're often kind of disappointed by what they see mm-hmm. and they write about it. And, and that to me was, was just, you know, magic. So there are two, um, and, and I'll speak about it in general terms, um, two things that struck me. First, well, I guess not so general, but uh, Campbell, his sort of visceral um, dislike for Napoleon, but not for the man himself, more that he was this enemy that his country just loathed for so long. And, and the way you express it, I, I, you could almost feel... Like, whether you admire Napoleon or not, you could understand this. I don't want to quite call it hatred, but it's close to that. Um, can, can you comment on that bit first? Sure. I, I think if we put ourselves into this Neil Campbell's shoes, he's a he's born in Scotland. He's the kind of gentleman uh, of Scotland, and, and his whole family is a military family. And... Um, so if, you know, you're a military man in that age, who's the number one person you're sort of thinking about all day long? It's Napoleon. Mm-hmm. And uh, Campbell's brother, actually the sort of star of the family, gets killed fighting the French. So um, it's clear that there is a sort of animosity, to say the least. Um, he's been sort of his whole adult life has been about uh, seeing this person as an enemy. And that, again, is is a bizarre twist in that once Napoleon gets defeated by this Allied coalition, it falls to the British to really oversee his exile and his punishment. I think that there's a sense that um, the French have to sort out their own, what they're going to do after Napoleon, and um, the British and the Allies are sort of working together to, to form the solution. It's actually, sorry, sorry to go off on a tangent, but it's actually the Russians who are really driving it behind the scenes. But the British sort of become the the de facto wardens, let's say. And so a lot of responsibility falls on this Campbell. Um, Napoleon gets ferried towards Elba on a British ship, and um, people make a lot about that. They're like, well, is he in cahoots with, with, with England? Is there some sort of weird uh, backroom deal going on? It turns out it's all on the level. It's just nobody really knows what to do. They're making it up as, it goes, as, it, as they go along. Mm-hmm. And so here's this Campbell. He's in his 30s. He's an ambitious guy. Um, kind of a lonely soul, I think. And he is, you know, thrown into the situation with the most famous person on the planet. And so, hatred or not, there's a sort of wow factor and a sense of he realizes he's, he's making history. He, he, he now counts for something. And I think just on a sort of person to person level, they, they start talking. Um, there's a lot you can learn from Napoleon if you're a commanding officer, right? You're, mm-hmm. Here's a guy, and Napoleon is, has some time on his hands, and he's had a, you know, he has a, a, a bit of wine after dinner, and he gets to talking. And he mm-hmm. talks a lot about, well, what if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? Um, here's where I was really great at commanding this particular battle. Here's where I fell short. Here's where Wellington was really good. I mean, there's there's all sorts of stuff like that that, that Campbell's sort of eating up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the sad twist, I guess, is that um, this Campbell, who's a sort of innocent, I think, is completely tainted by his association with El- with uh, Napoleon and with his time on Elba. Mm-hmm. Um, once Napoleon escapes, I don't think that's a huge spoiler alert because we kind of know the history. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I would ask, since I'm not finished with the book yet, I would ask you not... I, I, I enjoy sort of the mystery of, of some of what you, you've said or written. Okay. So so let's hold off on Campbell. But Campbell okay. has his own trajectory, let's say, just like Napoleon, and, and they come together, they get increasingly intertwined as the book goes along. Okay. And I guess okay. you're, you're hitting on something which I, which I really wanted to try to do was, yes, it's all there in the history books, but um, there is a kind of sense of suspense as the, as the book goes along. How did this happen and why? 
And yeah, I think definitely the other characters, people won't nef- definitely or necessarily know their history. You know, there are some famous ones and some not famous at all. And I think, you know, you're curious how things end up for them um, and their interplay with Napoleon and all that. So, Exactly right. It's hard to compete on the page with Napoleon Bonaparte, but there are some people uh, in this story who have their own quite fascinating biographies and whose time in this little chapter is pretty is pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. And the other um, sort of thing I, I wanted to mention, and I got this from the book and also some outside research, um, the idea of um, the French taverns being a place where you can learn the, the, the mood of the people and get, you know, this information. Uh, because apparently I've read that there were so many taverns in, in France and, and that was sort of a way to gauge public feeling. Exactly right. No, the, you're... You're, you're spot on in, in mentioning that it's, it's such a, uh, an interesting way to think about history is that, you know, it's getting written in the bars in some ways. Uh, historians of France have wrestled with this, you know, how, especially for this moment. I'm talking about the book is in 1814, 1815, the Napoleonic uh, age, we could call it. Mm-hmm. How do you get at something like public opinion in this time where it's not, you know, so far removed in terms of uh, the press, of course, and freedom of speech? Uh, uh, and, and how news travels and is recorded from today. Um, how do you really understand how what people are thinking and how they're expressing themselves? And it's hard to do, of course, but one of the ways uh, is to look closely at the taverns, at, at, at these meeting places where people are drinking and talking. And there is uh, certainly the French police are paying attention. Uh, and there are agents sort of listening to what's going on. And Some of it is, you know, drunken soldiers saying they're kind of out of pay and out of work and saying, well, maybe things were a bit better when we were under uh, Napoleon and actually had something to do. Uh, That's part of it. Um, There's also some songs. Uh, One of the ones I mentioned, I won't won't go into too much detail, but one of the ones I mentioned is um, the wife of one of the people who comes along with Napoleon and ends up being one of his top advisors. His wife, Fanny, uh, travels down toward Elba and gets accosted by a French uh, prefect and kind of roughly searched. And um, she also happens to be very tall. And almost immediately, this song about tall Fanny starts getting sung in her hometown of Chateau Roux, mm-hmm. and it makes its way all acro- across the country, people talking about the injustice that she had suffered. So that's a little bit of, you know, that can be a propaganda tool in its own way, and totally, as I said, interesting for historians to be looking at that as a way to gauge public opinion. And so, and the book also touches on something else, which I think is important in military history. Um, people often, you know, when they look at battles and wars, they neglect um, sort of the peaceful voids between them. Um, you know, what happens what, once all that energy is gone? Um, what uh, what do the people do? And it, even today, you know, after the Iraq War, people thought, okay, it's all done. But then, you know, after that void, then the Syrian Civil War starts, you know, as, as sort of an out, outgrowth of it. Mm-hmm. And here, in your book, you talk about this, you know, the French... The different sides are still fuming and, and feel a sense of loss, and you wonder, you know, what, what, could this still lead to something? And it does. Um, so yeah. yeah, no, I agree, and, and I always, I mean, if you'll indulge me, I, I always think of it as a sort of surfing anal- analogy. I'm not a particularly good surfer, but I, I really like it. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, you think from the outside surfing is about the crest of the wave, right? You, you catch this wave and that's the ride and it's amazing. But in between, right, when you're sitting there on the board, that's not boring. That's really, to me, a part of the fun. You're seeing the last wave, you're kind of anticipating the next one, you're thinking about how you're going to place yourself, you're seeing, you know, the wind and everything around you and uh, and you're thinking. And, and I think that's how history works and especially military history works is – you know, there are these peaks and valleys, as you say, these voids, mm-hmm. um, which isn't to say an absence of action, just a different kind of action, and an action that really can inform both the upcoming action and help us to reflect on the past action. Um, so in between those waves is fascinating. You know, what are people thinking about what just happened? Mm-hmm. How are they anticipating what's going to happen? What's all the strategy going on, uh, you know, 
in, in that in between moment. You know, if you put that up into the forefront, that's a whole different way of thinking about history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So let's, uh, let's turn to, uh, the, the materials you used for your research. You mentioned Campbell's diary. Um, and you seem to have, there's a lot of personal information that I would think is from different diaries. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. And this is where I'll, you know, hopefully not geek out too much, but th this is for me is, is the fun part. It's actually, uh, as much as I like the writing, mm -hmm. the research is just, uh, is really the pure joy for me is this discovery of, uh, arcane stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I had here were again, a lot of people who, who joined the exile, um, were sort of minor figures in, within the French empire before doing so, because the big players sort of abandoned Napoleon, you know, they saw that there was a shift coming, uh, and they either sort of retired or they tried to find their way in the new regime, uh, understandably so. And then also understandably, here are these young, younger people or more obscure people saying, well, maybe if I stick with this guy, I'll be rewarded in some way, or he might even return and then I'll have a major, uh, role. And those people, um, I'm thinking of, you know, even people as low, low on the pecking order as valets, um, you know, I guess butlers, you would call them or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're, they're writing detailed diaries. Um, there is a, a very fascinating diary by a guy named Ponce, who is kind of the ruling bigwig on Elba before Napoleon comes. He's head of the mine, mining industry, which is the big industry in, on the island and, and sort of, a, a sort of paternal figure to to the islanders. Mm -hmm. He writes uh, several diaries uh, about his time with Napoleon for years and years, some of which are published and some of which are sort of uh, in his own papers. And then um, there are, of course, um, there's a lot of press, right, on this moment. People imagining it from afar or hearing rumors or sort of thinking about what's going on um, on the continent while this is all happening, and that's totally vital too. Um, and um, I also had a lot of, you know, it was kind of nice is I also had, there's so much written about Napoleon, I had a lot of great secondary sources that I could sort of take their, their, their few details about this moment and then really follow that trail and, and, uh, and sort of expand upon it. So for instance, this, uh, somebody named Alan Palmer wrote a really great book about Napoleon's second wife, mm -hmm. uh, Ari Louise, who a, plays a key role in my book. So I could sort of see what, what he had been looking at, go to those source documents, and then sort of see, well, how does that actually inform my own story, which is quite different from his own. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I'll say about the research is, uh, of course, going to Elba. That was, uh, you know, people laugh, well, that was, that was your excuse for writing the book. You just wanted to go hang out mm -hmm. on an Italian island. Uh, and I was, you know, not complaining about the research trip, but it was, uh, totally vital for me to, to see the place, really try and soak up the energy, live there for some extended period of time. So you get a sense of, you know, weather and geography and terrain and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and of course, uh, there are documents there. There are the sites where he actually lived. Mm -hmm. His villa is, is a museum. I could go on and on, but, um, maybe I'll stop there. No, that's fine. I don't mind you um, discussing that. I, I was going to ask how how much of the uh, the structures that you describe in the book are still, you know, existent. Um, you know, and I'm th also thinking of the pier. Um, there were a number of buildings that he uh, um, sort of muddled with. You know, sort of a uh, what's the word? Um, he took them for himself. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, that's you know, here's this here's an emperor, right? He's used to having chateaus and he's used to having uh to conquering in a sense. Mm -hmm. So he kind of does that on Elba. He here's this little island, I'm gonna claim that and I'm gonna claim that. There's actually one of the funny moments in the book is there's a little tiny island uh next to Elba. I don't know if you, <laughs> maybe I've gotten to this point yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> From your chuckle, right? He goes and he kinda of claims it for himself, his first conquest. Um the properties, what's great about them from, from a historian's perspective is they're all really close to each other. So you can really cover, the, they're in this capital city of Porto Ferraio. Um, and, and so I could sort of walk the, the, the same walk that he had, had done and seen the, the major, um, buildings that play a role in this history. Um, 
the villa is is his villa is pretty modest. It's kind of cool to see it because it's all the scale is pretty small. You really get a sense of how it was lived in. I hear it's the most uh, visited museum site in uh, Tuscany outside of the Uffizi in Florence. So I think for for Elba, they're doing you know they've done a good job of, of keeping it up because they see that it's it's an important sort of tourist site. Um, one last story I'll, I'll talk about the actual physical research was uh, I had a friend who on Elba who helped me uh, arrange for a meeting with the, the prison warden of Elba because there's a huge maximum security prison, uh, kind of a scary place actually. Hmm. It happens to be set in this beautiful cliffside Spanish, um, this old uh, Spanish citadel. And uh, I wanted to walk the citadel because Napoleon had stayed there for a couple nights. So here's this big uh, kind of bear-like Italian warden who doesn't speak much English uh, and maybe isn't that happy to be taking time off his work to be <laughs> showing around this random dude. But he's sort of walking me around. And and uh, as I said, it was a kind of a, a mix between scary and beautiful. And, and uh, you know, at the end, I said in my sort of really mangled Italian, I said, it's so weird to come here just because of a couple nights 200 years ago. And, and, you know, I really appreciate this and thank you. And he kind of looks at me and he shrugs and he says, you know, uh, you're writing a book about Napoleon here. You got to see what he sees. And I thought that was kind of a cool way to, that actually encapsulated the theme of what I was going for is it's all about, you know, this invisible emperor, as the title says, you know, mm-hmm. being seen and unseen and what does he see and who sees him and how does that play into all the, 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 this historical moment. Mm-hmm. Do they have, were you shown any artifacts um, from his stay there? Interestingly, no, there wasn't that much, I guess, material culture. There was a sort of, I think a lot of the stuff in the villa was were replicas. Uh, it was more about the grounds and the buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know that there was that much, it, it, there, there wasn't the grandeur, of course, right? So mm-hmm. I think they were pretty, there wasn't that much stuff. And I think whatever stuff there was, they kind of took with them on these seven boats when they left. Uh, I think it was probably mostly wine and food mm-hmm. and, and gold coins. I don't think they amassed a whole great deal of, you know, hmm. uh, regalia, I guess you would say. Well, I can imagine uh, the people who lived there at the time might have, it seems like a place where families stay for for a while. So I imagine, I, I just wondered if there were people who's, <laughs> who said, oh, my family, you know, my family from 200 years ago got this touched by Napoleon or, you know, something like that. Totally right. So actually the one instance I had of that was the, the, the little, I guess you would call it a villa where I, where I was lucky enough to stay where I rented actually just through Airbnb. Uh, the woman who owned it, uh, said, you know, this is owned, you know, by generations ago, blah, blah, blah. And here are these two great carob trees um, and Napoleon came and admired these trees and he said, he commented on how beautiful they were. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, that's like a nice story. Probably everybody in Elba has a similar story of something that, as you say, Napoleon saw or touched. Mm-hmm. And then lo and behold, I'm, uh, looking in the, I think Ponza's diary or one of these diaries and it mentions these two carob trees and the geography of it and it lines up exactly with what she's saying. So she was actually, you know, uh, totally telling the truth is, is that, Napoleon had come to this particular villa and said, those are beautiful trees and stayed for a meal. And that got into the book, actually, in a little footnote. Yeah. And 200 years later, you were admiring them as well. There you go. I mean, looking out at them while I was actually typing the book. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, so did you mention, so the diaries and the, the papers, did you mention uh, where uh, you found these these documents? A lot of those are... Um, the, the main source is the French, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the, the French National Library in Paris has, you know, incredible collection. Um, some of that is done on site and some of, some of that I could, was able to actually do, um, from home because it's been digitized, which is pretty, uh, a pretty incredible resource. Mm-hmm. Um, always nice, of course, to see the real thing up close and find out, you know, how it's how it's categorized and what might be close by and all those kinds of things that are still cool about a library, but mm-hmm. also very convenient. Um, I was kind of bouncing between uh, Stanford and, and Vancouver during the last stage of the book, and, and those two libraries um, also helped me a great deal. But yeah, the, the most of the of the stuff was either uh, 
you know, finding, going to Elba, buying whatever I, I could book wise, rare books, um, and then going to, to, to Paris. Um, and a lot of, a lot of just old books purchased online as well. Um, because some of these things were printed in the, in the 19th century when people were, were, were it was still kind of a fresh story. And, and, and there's a lot of original documents in there as well. Hmm. Uh, um, yeah, it's kind of weird with Napoleon. You can you can really get carried away, right? Because it's such a global, he's such a global figure and such a global story. Mm -hmm. There are, of course, uh, archival remnants. Uh, the Vatican would have been great if I'd had a bit more time. I'm sure they had uh, stuff on him. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously the UK. Um, I, I you'll see. You know, it's it's pretty thick back there in the bibliography and the, the end notes. It, it was quite a few years of research, mm -hmm. um, but certainly I think. Could have been twice as long. Mm -hmm. And and I ask this question. I'm not minimizing your effort nope. and work, but mm -hmm. considering Napoleon, the fascination with him for 200 years, why why do you think no one else? Well, has anyone written a book similar about his time on Elba? Um, and why would why did no one else write about this until now the way you have? Yeah. So the the answer to the why no one else is kind of the depending on your taste going to make this sound like a boring book or like a totally fascinating book I obviously lean to the latter mm -hmm. which is it seems at first glance uh, that nothing happens on Elba precisely because of what we've been talking about it's this it's the sort of valley between the two waves um, that so if you're writing about Napoleon there's so much drama there's so much uh, to cover that's always just like a little nod within the bigger history mm -hmm. uh you know, this happened, this happened, this happened. He got sent to Elba, and then he came back, and here's the, the action resumes. Um, so I think that explains why there's a kind of dearth of material. Uh, there's a book from 1982 from Oxford. Uh, this guy, um, Norman Mackenzie, wrote uh, specifically about the, the exile. He focused on it. And it's kind of, it's a little dry. Um, it's very kind of, you know, fact fact fact, 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 here's what happened, here's what happened, um, without too much argument, without too much sort of emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked the book. It was a, it was a great resource, uh, and, and, and I'm glad it was, you know, that he wrote it. But I think in the sort of 30 years since then, um, uh, there, there's obviously more documents have been released, and, uh, and I, I think there was a way to do it a bit, a bit, with a bit more excitement. Mm-hmm. And um, I certainly haven't read as much about Napoleon as people who are really into the Napoleonic War are, but I feel like I have read a lot about, um, you know, French history and, and military stuff, and I feel like this is the first time I really got a feel for the kind of person Napoleon was and, and why and how he campaigned the way he did. Um, so, yeah, I, so I, I really liked it. Um, or I'm Thanks. still enjoying it. No, I appreciate that. And if that's the case, I think it has less to do with me than, again, with the kind of project and with the fact that there are so many people who are actually getting to know him as, as much as you can know Napoleon at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it was, again, kind of surprising that nobody had written about this, or at least not recently, mm -hmm. is there's so many kind of intimate uh, moments with with this person, and so you do get, I, I hope, a, a feel of who he was as a person, which isn't to defend his actions or sort of put him up as a, any kind of hero. It's just sort of here as a human figure who is, uh, you know, has his faults like any of us, and has his has his um, has his strengths as well, and is just living life in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it cer it certainly inspires me to uh, after I'm finished with this to pick up other biographies on Napoleon to compare how they uh, they portray him as well. What did you find in your research that was most enjoyable? What part of the research was most enjoyable? I think, and again, this is a, you know, maybe a risky statement if, if people are, are, are interested of coming to this book or listening to this podcast because they're interested in Napoleon. What actually I found most fascinating was everybody else. Uh, Napoleon is inherently fascinating, right? There are 800 page biographies about him every second year, or even every year, it seems. Mm -hmm. Um, but I loved all these kind of minor characters who show up, 
Um, and, uh, you know, there's a guy who has been assigned since he was kidnapped as a child it, and given to Napoleon as a gift during the Egyptian campaign. Uh, his job has been to protect Napoleon with he sleeps outside his room, right? You, you probably got to this point mm-hmm. in the book. Uh, when Napoleon, um, you know, gets defeated, this guy kind of runs away. And people are calling him a sort of coward and this awful person. And it's like, well, no, this guy's surviving, you know. Uh, that, I, I want to know more about him. I actually ended up reading about him for a couple of days and I could have written a whole chapter on, on Rustam Reza was his name. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, he gets maybe a paragraph in the book because there's other stuff to talk about. But those little detours for me have always been, uh, what interests me about history. Hmm. Uh, who are, what are, who are these other, lives that are a little less celebrated in it, but can be kind of equally fascinating and luckily we have this moment uh and this character you know to draw us in and then we get to kind of paint in all these other interesting details so that to me was the real not to uh, diminish napoleon's you know fascinating time on elba but everyone else was kind of interesting too mm-hmm. yeah so what did you find in your research that was most surprising um, I guess, again, this is sort of, I don't want to say give away too much of the, of the ending, but I was, I'll say that it was interesting to me how little what people thought on in France had to do with Napoleon's return. I was expecting to find this huge wave of support wanting to bring him back. Uh, this huge sort of conspiracy, if you will, um, working behind the scenes secretly to say, you know, we're unhappy with the replacement government. Uh, let's get Napoleon back. That actually wasn't the case. Uh, so again, without revealing the end, it's kind of fascinating to think, how did he do it? How did he pull it off? How did he sail from Elba, land on the beach in southern France, and march to Paris without firing a single shot? That to me is surely great mysteries of the last, you know, 200 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so what, the surprise being that I guess I didn't find, you know, the answer I had expected in the, re, in the research. Mm-hmm. Okay. What, uh, what issue was most difficult to research? Uh, maybe something that you finally did, um, feel like you came to satisfactory conclusion on or, um, something that maybe you, you still grappled with and would really like an answer for. Um, I guess to run with the idea of difficult, uh, it's always difficult to deduce somebody's motivations. I think I make a little note in my acknowledgments or whatever when I'm kind of explaining my methodology. Mm. It's hard enough among even people who say you live with or in your family to deduce everyone's motivations, why they do what they do, right? And those are people who are living and breathing and who we see every day. Now you go back 200 years, all you have is the historical record, these, these archives, these written documents, um, you know, images, what have you, material culture, um, artifacts. It's, it, it, I found it kind of frustrating that I didn't know more about um, what motivated him to do what he did. Mm-hmm. Again, this question of why. So I do a little bit of, of supposition at the end. You know, this is what I think. Here's what I think why why he left. When I, as I said earlier when we were talking now, it seems so illogical. Uh, you know, that, that I found difficult to try and get inside this person's head. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned the Vatican is a place uh, that maybe has documents that you would have liked to see. Do you know of anything specific that... Uh, that you didn't get a chance to look at that would have been helpful or, you know, what, what do you conjecture you might have found to add to what you uh, researched? There's one very big uh, mystery that I don't know there are any documents to really answer, and that is um, Campbell, you know, our, our de facto warden, as I called him, um, seems to get tied up with uh, a woman in Florence, who's known to us as the Contessa Miniacci. And she's apparently very beautiful and very mysterious Mm -hmm. and very beguiling. And the kind of scuttlebutt is that 
Campbell is actually maybe with her when Napoleon escapes. And so was she, you know, a double agent? Was she just a kind of innocent bystander who happened to like this dashing young uh, colonel? Um, I could not find uh, more than, you know, a few traces of her as much as I researched, Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was even her real name. Uh, So this is coming to me from French spies, um, a few memoirists, people who are talking after the fact, um, people who, who have alluded to being in the presence of her and Campbell at the same time. And I don't make any wild, you know, speculation, speculations because, you know, I would lose my historian's license, of course, but I'm trying to kind of get at the heart of that story. And it's, it's, it, it is a kind of tantalizing mystery. Who, 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 who was she? You know, I would love to know more. I, as I said, I just don't think there are actually any more documents out there that would help that I know of to, you know, or else I would have looked there. But maybe one day we will discover some treasure trunk full of, hmm. you know, revealing documents. That's, I think historians always wish for that sort of thing with their, uh, their subject matter. Yes, which is why some of us take, you know, 10 years to write a book and more power to the people who can, who can do that. That's, you know, it's, that's the dream. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I, I think a book is as long as it needs to be. Uh, you kind of know when um, when you have to stop, or else you know the, the returns start diminishing. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's always more. There is always, always more to learn. Mm-hmm. So, was there anything you discovered that uh, really emotionally moved you in some way, either negatively or positively? Yeah, I was I was struck by the presence of uh, the women in Napoleon's life. Uh, at this time, uh, how important a role they played, um, only because the rap on Napoleon was that he was just such a heartless person and really, um, you know, I, I don't think that, that people really um, give full agency to, to the women in his life or think that he was that interested in the women in his life. Uh, it so happened while he was on Elba, uh, his first wife Josephine passes away in Paris mm-hmm. that affects him quite quite deeply and he's also um, wrestling with his second wife I mentioned earlier Marie Louise who's, who's quite a bit you know more than two decades younger than him and whom I think he actually genuinely uh, genuinely loves and misses uh, and there's a kind of uh, you know there's a there's a power play between the two of them whether she's going to come to Elba or not and as I said I won't give that away but uh, so that relationship was interesting and Napoleon's mother and his favorite sister Pauline do come to Elba um, quite early on in the exile and live very closely to him and there's a lot of interaction there and it's quite quite touching I thought uh, in its own way Mm -hmm. to see this person at home uh, with his mother and with his sister and what they get up to and I was totally you you know uh, struck by how, how rich in their, in, in their own complicated ways, uh, those relationships worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do you hope the book will do? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I guess the, the little humble, small contribution is that is to say, um, here's a, here's a, here's a great story that I hope is well told that fills in this little blank, uh, that if you're interested in, Napoleon, um, you know, you probably didn't know that much about this moment, but I, I, I would hope that it actually, uh, you know, in an ideal world would spread beyond that, the Napoleon buffs, uh, toward people who are just looking for a kind of interesting, uh, bit of history that's also a kind of family drama, that's also a bit of a jailbreak story, and is actually a, an interesting story in its own right, um, that has, you know, would appeal to people who have no interest in Napoleon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a kind of ideal. And then, as I said, this methodological argument as a historian I try to make, which is not, I'm not by any means claiming to have invented it, but is to return to this idea of maybe a different way of writing history is to kind of flip between these moments uh, that seem to us to not be as obviously dramatic and really show that just as any day in life can be exceptionally dramatic just for small moments um the same is true of of history if we look closely at something if we care deeply enough about it 
uh, and try to kind of empathize with with what's going on at the human level. Uh, any kind of day in history is 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 quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book finished um, or published, and how you overcame those? Uh, no, very boring answer. It was all very easy. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a great team at, at, at Penguin, and they kind of got the idea right away. Uh, I think that a lot of that um, things that would have been uh, seen as, as tasks to be surmounted, I sort of tackled with the first book. So my first book was about uh, Monte Carlo and the history of this first resort, you know, 100 years before Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And it also started with that question, you know, what, what is this place? How did they get away with it? Who started Monte Carlo? I wanted to know. And so, uh, again, not finding really a book to answer that question, I sort of uh, researched it and ended up writing one myself. Mm -hmm. That took a long time. Uh, I was learning about how to how to write um, narrative nonfiction that would grip people. Um, and I think after that, I got a bit of confidence mm -hmm. and had this idea and sort of got lucky in terms of finding what I wanted to research wise and had a, had a nice beginning, middle and end to the story inherently set up by what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Um, so my job was just to sort of be the, be the conduit to, to get this out. And, and as I said, uh, it's a, it's a bit of a, maybe a weird thing to throw your resources behind if you're a publisher from the outset, because it sounds sort of counterintuitive. But as I said, um, people at Penguin just got it right away. So then it mm -hmm. made it easier. It was just, okay, deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came, it came quite quickly. Uh, just to make a brief tangent here. Sure. Um, how, how do you, how did you develop your um, skills at writing good narrative nonfiction? You know, I come, I come out of a, a PhD background, right? So uh, the research to me is, was always the focus of that and, and, and trying to make scholarly arguments and really trying to back it up with how to, how to navigate an archive, um, how to, how to really surround any historical moment with a lot of evidence that I kind of had from years and years mm. of training. Uh, and I'm thankful to kind of, you know, my, my graduate, uh, mentors for those skills. Mm. Um, turning it into narrative prose, as I said, you know, obviously I'm, I'm still learning. Um, but it comes down to, I think, again, like any kind of storytelling we do, even with our friends and family, it's, it's uh, people and, and places, right? People and places are inherently interesting. Work is inherently interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. So you got you got a people and a place, and they're doing something. That's that's what you got to focus on. So just as you as people would in a novel, right? We want to care about this character. We want to know a little bit about the setting, and we want to see some action. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, it's I find it easier than writing a novel I, I, uh, because. The story is already set up for me. Mm -hmm. the, the broad strokes. I know what happened. Now it's just about investigating and and uh, and keeping it centered on people and making us care about these people, making them seem human. So you know, I'm not as I said. I don't mean to be boastful, but I think if that's if that's if there's a skill that might be it is, uh, of trying to make that leap between a potentially dry diary or letter. Or police report, or accounting document, or uh, tax ordinance, or you know all these other things that I saw, turning that into an actual uh, human form, as a human engaged in some kind of activity that is potentially dramatic. That's really the skill. And um, how about the uh, technical aspect of creating, constructing a sentence that that grabs people and making that into a paragraph that grabs people and then into a full chapter in the narrative. That has the the right kind of flow. It, it, did you do you know any? Is that more classroom learning practice? Uh, maybe some natural ability or editors maybe. See, I should have a good answer for that. Seeing as though I do, you know, <laughs> I have taught uh, writing in the past, uh, but I think, as I say to my classes when I do this, there's no real guru like secret. It's just, you know, you, 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 we're all readers, hopefully, if we're writers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you find the style that works for you. So I try to kind of stay out of my own way, I guess, is 
what I would, how I would describe my style at the sentence level and paragraph level. Uh, it's always tempting to use the $10 word. Uh, usually the 10 cent word is much better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so those kind of fundamentals of, you know, active verbs, short sentences, um, not too much, um, uh, unnecessary adjectives, all those kinds of things. That's just how I do things. Mm -hmm. Works for me. Uh, luckily, I have an editor that then says, uh, you know, let's maybe hem this in a bit. Let's expand this. Uh, here you're getting a bit carried away. And I also um, luckily have, uh, you know, a wife who will listen to me uh, read this stuff mm -hmm. uh, for hours on end. And, and then when you read something out loud, you kind of, especially with another person in the room, you kind of know right away when something sounds clunky, uh, which isn't to say there aren't still clunkers in there. I'm sure there are, but it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of really great, uh, test of, of what works and what doesn't once you say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what's your next writing project? Ah, that remains to be seen. I'm still, uh, kicking the tires on many. I, I guess I say kicking the tires, probably subconsciously because one of the things that has always interested me uh, another one of these questions that I want answered is about Michelin uh, the Michelin company hmm. I want to know how these people who started out making rubber balls and then uh, as toys and then became the, the tire people obviously uh, are now in charge of telling us about fine dining you know why are we why are we listening to these tire people hmm. about uh, who should have stars in restaurants and, and I think there's probably an interesting family history there, at least, or a company history. Uh, whether or not that will be a book, I'm not sure. It's very early days, but that's that's the one I'm sort of circling around. Uh, I'm not quite sure if, if it'll make it or not. It, it, as I said with everything, it, 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 it all depends on the research first. Mm -hmm. Are the archives and are the archives uh, inherently in intriguing? That, that, that we'll see. Mm -hmm. And then I always wonder why Michelin has so many... Uh interesting World War I battle uh, field guides that came out right after that war. Totally. Uh, <laughs> I, they're almost like, uh, you know, I, of course I should have thought of that g given what we're talking about. Uh, they're totally, their war history, both World Wars is totally weird and, and, and wonderful. Uh, those 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 guides, I'm sure, I guess you've seen them, you know, they're mm -hmm. almost like tourist guides in a sense mm -hmm. for, for soldiers. Like, here's what you're going to run into when you get to, you know, such and such German village. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Oh yeah. Um, so where can people find the book and, uh, any, any thoughts or writings of yours, uh, maybe on social media? Um, interesting. Yeah. I'm not a big social media guy. I guess I should be, uh, <laughs> I'm, I don't know if it's being, uh, I'm, you know, uh, 40. So maybe I'm just at the cusp of, a little bit post pre digital, um, old, uh, old fuddy daddy. Hmm. So, not a whole lot of social media for me right now, although that might change. I do have a website. Um, I'll, I'll try and, I'm going to try and write some stuff around this book, uh, hopefully soon. Um, but that's not really a satisfying answer. So, I can't give you one. I guess the fact, uh, finding the book, you know, from what I hear, it's, it's in all the, the, the big stores, obviously online, and in uh, we always love the, the specialty stores to give them a shout out. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, in your neighborhood, uh, that's where I will be looking for it in my hometown of Vancouver uh, on October 9th. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I guess I guess that's all I can say. So, what's your website? Uh, the website is my name, Mark Brody, M A R K B R A U D E dot com. Okay, uh, and that. Yeah, that has links to the other book, a bit of my a bit of my press writing, uh, my you know writing in, in newspapers and such. Mm -hmm. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final words or thoughts? Um, I'm just I'm thrilled to be talking with you about this, and, I, and what I like is it sounds you know it's, it's so cool to be talking to somebody who seems to get the concept um, right off the bat. This idea of uh, of a kind of counterintuitive history, especially, you know, given that military history is, is the focus. Here's something where there's a, not too many battles, uh, but I still think it qualifies, and, and I'm glad that, uh, I'm just glad that you you had the interest. Good, yeah. Thank you. I, I certainly, as I keep saying, I, I love the book, so um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening. One of the best ways to provide feedback on this podcast is to rate it on iTunes.
please let me know if you liked it or give me a poor rating if you didn't like this podcast and I can use that feedback to hopefully get better. Otherwise, please follow me on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar on YouTube under War Scholar 1945 on Twitter at War Scholar on Facebook under War Scholar and you can find more information on my website warscholar.org please remember my name Chris does not have an H so it's C-R-I-S A-L-V-A-R-E-Z Thank you, and I hope you continue to enjoy this podcast.